Hayden Locke, President and CEO of Maramaca Copper, developing the Maramaca Oxide project in northern Chile. Hi, I'm Simon Clark. I'm CEO and a director of American Lithium. Uh, we have the development stage uh, hard rock project Falchani in Peru and uh, development stage um, Claystone Lithium project in Nevada. And Mark Selby, uh, President and CEO of Canon Nickel. Right. Okay, gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Um, I, I, you're here under false pretenses. I actually need your help. I've been stupid enough, mad enough to do what you guys have done. I've gone and bought a copper mine and I don't know really what I'm meant to be doing with it. You've been through the phases. You've all, you all had sort of different sets of needs and drivers initially, and you've kind of come at it from slightly different ways, but you've ended up where very few people get to, and that's advanced development stories. Okay. So I'm, I'm intrigued. So, I mean, for you, Hayden, um, I know you sort of joined laterally, but the, 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 maybe talk a little bit about the journey that you went on, some of the things that you recognize as that you needed to do for your company to be able to get to this point. Yeah, I think when I joined, Maramaca had the unique, I guess, characteristics that I thought would have the potential to create a mine in the future, uh, you know, relatively low capital cost, manageable operating cost in a, in a great jurisdiction. Um, I think one of the key things that we identified quite early was uh, it just lacked the scale. And although scale is not everything, it is quite important in a mining context, um, having enough scale to really amortise some of those fixed costs and therefore drive down your operating costs. So our big focus over the last three years is about, has been about creating that scale uh, through exploration, through the drill bit, and we've been pretty successful in doing that. And we're now at a scale which is big enough that financing institutions will be interested in it. It's got a long enough mine life that they'll feel comfortable about financing it. And we're getting to that scale where equity and um, strategic partners are starting to get interested in as well, as evidenced by uh, Mitsubishi Corp investing in our company very recently. And what about for you, Simon? Because, I mean, you, your, your challenges were, again, slightly different. So what, 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 what were they? What did you recognise? I, I, I guess, I mean, I came in, I, I joined American Lithium as a director um, probably about nine months before I was asked to be CEO. And, um, you know, over that piece, I guess we went from being a single asset company focused on Nevada, and then I came in literally as we completed the acquisition of Plateau Energy, which brought us Falchani and also Makassani on the uranium side. But I, I, I would say the real challenges that, that, that we faced is making sure you can make progress in difficult times. And, and, and by that, I mean, Nevada is a wonderful jurisdiction, um, but the permitting process in the States is challenging. So, you know, we've tried to be smart in, uh, in making sure you can drive ahead. I mean, it took us 14 months to, to get a plan of operations in place, but we'd already done the work before that to know there were no main environmental hurdles. We know we don't have any environmental issues in, in, our, in the location we're in. We've done a bunch of work to lock up water rights, things like this. So thinking ahead, taking the steps you can, and, you know, rather than even attempting to permit a pilot in Nevada, we, you know, we very much focused on piloting with a, with a partner, you know, some of the big major laboratories globally that analyze um, lithium products. And, you know, and then on Peru, of course, we didn't know when we acquired it that two months later we'd have a very dysfunctional government coming in. And it's not my place to criticize the Peruvian people for who they elect. And that only mean dysfunctional because you had a left-leaning president uh, dealing with a centre-right parliament. So if you were a producer in Peru at that time, you uh, you know you were great because the commodity prices were high, and it's a, and it's actually a very fair fiscal regime and it's actually a good mining code. Um, but for developers waiting for permits, it was it's just a gong show because you know the ministries were full of people who had no idea what they were doing, and um, you know really the intent just seemed to block projects such as ours. And so, you know, that's, I, what that taught us, Matt, is to be flexible and think on your feet. We filed a, a, an EIA that allowed us to get back drilling because it's a prescribed process. We won't wait for drill permits under that. And, you know, and then obviously we focused a lot on the VET side. So it's, it's keeping going what you can when you're in some of these jurisdictions and, um, and, and and making progress where you can because you have to feed the machine. I mean, yes, you want to keep developing, but 
you're a public company and you, you know you need your milestones and you need to flow. Well, well, yeah, a, 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 amen. Public companies have a whole bunch of different challenges, but let, let's go. Let's go to Mark. Scale was was something you wanted to deliver, but you started much smaller than the other guys. You started super, super early, and you needed to deliver that scale. What? How? How did you think you needed to go about that? How did you go about that? Well, I think sort of picking up on what Hayden said first off is in terms of, you know, I think it's basically picking a location where you can actually build a mine. You know, there's lots of places in the globe that are geologically interesting where you might find a really, really neat deposit. But when you step back and say, you know, can I actually, you know, will, will, will the government actually let me build it or not? You know, that that's a big question. You know, would it cost me five billion dollars to actually build a project in that location? And so I would have to find, you know, the third biggest deposit of a certain mineral ever to be able to justify the economics that are there. So I think that's number one is like basically going into a place where you can actually you know, build a mine. And then the two other pieces there is in terms of scale, you know, that that's critical. And, and again, I think, you know, Hayden hit on the key points of one, you know, it's, it's a scale that's that's big enough that financiers are going to be interested in. It's going to be a long life enough, a long enough life project as well that financiers, you know, are, are going to be interested in. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the final big benefit, again, when you get to the point where you want to get to the development stage, you know, the, the way you get rich, you know, you basically have you know, you, you basically, you know, have multiple people doing work for you that you benefit from, or you use other people's money. And so, you know, the place in mining where you get to use other people's money is where you've got a big enough development project, you know, that you can, you can get, you know, an offshore uh, trading company, you know, to get involved or one of the major mining companies to basically buy into your project in a way that minimizes the amount of equity that you have to raise and dilute your shareholders, you know, to, to, to take that forward. So, you know, that, that's that's the piece that, you know, a lot of people talk about grade, you know, but from my perspective, I would rather have scale in terms of actually being able to build a real real mining operation going forward that's going to be successful. Okay. Can, can I just talk, can I talk about, you know, I, I, I talked about being slightly fearful, this endeavor of mine, maybe because it's the first time, but you guys have been there, um, you know, when, when you guys started off and now it's kind of, it feels like when I talk to you guys, it's like water for ducks back because the markets have been, a shocker for the sense like the end of 2020 beginning of 2021 right and you guys have been through a few cycles you've seen it all before but you but even you must have even all of you must have been thinking this 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 is a, this is not nice i'm not enjoying this so you can't blame investors like you can't blame uh, people who are voting in the wrong politicians you can't blame investors for getting nervous about all of the different headlines, narratives that are out there and, you know, feeling very nervous about what's going on. So Hayden, what, what would you say, to, what, what, co what calming words would you say to uh, investors, shareholders and the like? Well, I think I've said it previously that investing, in, especially in the junior end of mining, is not a short term endeavor. You can get lucky and things can swing in your favor and you can make, you know, exceptional returns in the short term. Uh, but in order to really protect yourself, uh, from those swings and roundabouts, you've got to be taking a long-term view. Um, and as somebody once said to me, you know, a high quality project in a good commodity, in a good location will always bubble to the surface as the pendulum swings uh, backwards and forwards in this beautiful thing we call the mining cycle. And it's actually those distortions, uh, you know, those short-term opportunities where the baby's being thrown out with the bathwater that provide the biggest opportunities to make money. Uh, if you really have the courage of your convi convictions, obviously don't go too hard, but have the courage of your convictions and um, buy a little bit more uh, if you still believe in the project. Ask yourself the question that uh, Mr. Buffett always asks himself, what's changed? Nothing. Okay, I still like it. I'm going to buy some more. Okay, so do, is it true, therefore, Hayden, that the opposite is true? If it's, if it's not a good asset and not a good jurisdiction... Uh, with the timing right, that, that obviously you, you run you run for the hills. But what have what have you seen out there in terms of the, the way that some companies or some management teams have behaved during this period that for you would be red flags? Yeah, I think um, well, it, it depends. It's, Without it depends naming names, you know, <laughs> it depends on how much you know about mining. But look, there is a um, there is a widely held perception at the junior end of the market that there is uh, you know show me a hole in the ground with a liar on top and I'll show you a gold company promoter. I uh, have been a gold company promoter. I think it's unfair, but you know, we're in competition for capital. And if you're, if you're out there um, promoting a story, 
I think the way I always look at things is if it sounds too good to be true relative to companies that you know and respect and are in operations, then it probably is too good to be true. So, you know, really benchmark it against existing operations that are slightly similar to what's going on. Um, but I look at assumptions, commodity price assumptions, uh, mining cost assumptions, are they in the right ballpark, not too far one way or the other, um, you know, making sure that the capital cost assumptions are right, uh, making sure that they're not smoothing over certain areas which are, um, you know, potentially going to be challenging. And it's common sense in many cases, challenging from an approvals perspective and all of those sorts of things. Um, and then I think the other aspect is, you know, that you look at the nuance, um, maybe touching on the point that Simon made about, okay, Nevada may be a more challenging environment now than it has been previously, but I would argue that Nevada is probably one of the best locations in the US to permit a, a new project. Uh, looking at the nuances of perm permitting within a certain you know, jurisdiction is quite important. And I often see companies who are looking at, say, a Maramaca, which is in the Antofagasta region, and trying to piggyback on the unique proposition that we have, uh, but they're in a completely different situation, you know, with a with a much larger indigenous population or environmental uh, risk associated with them, uh, with far greater impacts on the surrounding environment. And so it's not really an apples for apples comparison. So those are the sort of things that I look out for and sometimes get frustrated with. Right. Okay. And some good points in there. Well, well, well mentioned and well noted. Um, Simon, for you, and by the way, do, guys, do feel free to kind of j jump in with, with, on top, uh, build on what each other is saying. But Simon, for you, so some of the things we've talked about there in terms of, you, you talked about Peru, right? So some, sometimes time is a great healer sometimes in, in very bad relationships. Uh, but in, for the, for companies, there are moments like this where you, know, you can't time the market always, all of the time. Um, you, do have you know not so good governments come in um, to power, and that you know that's a waiting game. But what are the things that you, as a company, need to remind yourself of, need to remind shareholders of, in terms of things that you can do um, oper operationally? Because the federal government may be putting some barriers up, but maybe locally, provincially, um, it's it's fine, or some of the states are are fine. You can operate. So it is nuanced, as, as, as uh, Hayden said, isn't it? For, for for sure, and I think I think I totally agree with what he said off the top. I mean, you shouldn't be investing really short term. Um, you know, I mean, just since it, um, just over the last year or two, you've seen lithium, you know, go all the way up to eighty thousand a ton on on the so called spot market. Now I never I question whether that's real, and then fall all the way back to twenty, and then go back up to over forty, and I think now it's in the thirty. So it's a it's a roller coaster ride, so I think it's 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 key that you you like the asset more than anything. And I think both Hayden and Mark talk about scale, ability to to actually produce something viable at the end of the day, and all of that all of that obviously becomes clear. But but it, but if that's what you've got, then then absolutely, you, you, you know, you do have to be patient. Sometimes you have to be patient with commodity prices. You definitely have to be patient, you know, in certain jurisdictions, whether it's Nevada and, and time wise to get permits, because Hayden's right, you know, you, you stick in, you get your permit, there's no better place to really have a, have a mine. Um, and then, you know, you point out Peru, it's been, it's had some issues over the last couple of years, but, you know, you know that this is a, a world-class, large-scale opportunity, and so you remain patient, you focus on the things you can do, like I mentioned off the top, we did a lot of really good uh, metallurgical work with, uh, with Ansto in, in Australia. Uh, we were able, because it was a prescribed form that didn't require permits, we were able to file a, our environmental impact assessment early, which allowed us to get drilling on site, a lot of it for hydrological reasons, but we could also drill coal, which allowed us to keep expanding the resource. Um, and, um, you know, and it's also going to help us fast track the permitting uh, of a mine when we get to the back end. So you're totally right, Matt. I mean, it, it's about patience, but it's about knowing you've got a good asset first and foremost, and it makes sense to be patient and then thinking about how you can advance. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of different aspects that come together to pull together a mine, obviously, and being able to advance some of those at all time if you can, is obviously key. 
Right, M- moving forward, g- growing the story is interesting. But my, can, I, can I just quickly, because before I forget, is you said something about I'd rather have a scale with low grade, right? Now, you can't have a scale with low grade if the economics aren't there, right? Because you're not going to get that finance. The market's not going to be interested. So how important is it for a company like, like yours and, and, and others, obviously, to get to the economic phase or at least be able to put a, a marker in the sand quickly so people do understand that it will make money um no no i think it it's it's incredibly important again i think in terms of you know for investors you know the fact um if if someone is continually just drilling with no resource on the horizon or no no engineering study on the horizon it's probably because they don't want the an- they know what the answer is and they don't want people to see what the <laughs> what the answer is going to be so you know I, I think you know to the extent that you can demonstrate the economics as, as quickly as and effectively as possible you know to, to me it's an you know it's it's a no-brainer and particularly if it's a deposit type that people aren't familiar with you know you you have to you know, sort of help educate them by providing some of the numbers, because again, there's, there's a lot of rules of thumb that people use. Some are great and some are make no sense whatsoever. And, and particularly in, in certain commodities. And, and, I, and I think I was just going to build on what Mark said. I mean, I think Matt, you look at, I mean, you look at our uranium deposit, at, at, at Matt Kassani, you know, it's, 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 it's low grade when you compare it to the Athabasca. And so, some investors have a mindset where they're not even going to look at that. But then it sits right at surface. There's incredibly low strip. It's hosted in rocks that don't eat acid. And so your recovery is you use 9 to 10 kilograms a ton of acid. It's one of the best projects globally from that perspective. So it's highly economic. So yes, grade is important, but it's only one factor. And I agree with Mark, I think, figuring out scale and economics early is a, is a really key piece. Well, I think Hayden, you're the same. You've, you, you've, you've got oxides at surface, right? Yeah, I was just going to say, it sounds like Mark and Simon, you both have the same issue with the comment grade is king that I do, which is, is it doesn't take into account all of the other aspects which drive the economic fundamentals of the project. Yeah, I mean, Mark, we, we, we've had the conversation many, many a time. In fact, I've, I've had it with, with gold, Guys, as well, this isn't. I know this is pretty much. You know, if you've got copper, lithium, and and nickel lined up here today, but it's the same. Same for the gold guys. The, the grade is king thing. Whoever invented that, it needs addressing. And you know, we've tried to several times, but it just it doesn't seem to go in. But it's one of many, many variables, folks. And I'm, I'm sort of I am conscious of of that. Um, just just on the coming talking about, is there such a thing, Mark, as too big? Because I've seen companies that have just drilled, drilled, drilled built up massive resources and then we're into several billions of dollars you're 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 kind of getting there because you need a you need a big balance sheet for the, the scale of projects which you're going to do but so, so so do others but is there such a thing as too big or if you can if you can show the economics is it fine always oh 100 percent. i think in the gold business you know there's just a basically a lot of explorers just sit there and you know, will add ounces infinitum, you know, as long as they said, but I think they're building on what Simon said, you know, in terms of, you know, A, being patient and then B, you know, depending on where you are in the capital cycle, you know, there are lots of ways to add value to a project and just drilling, drilling is expensive, right? It's probably the most expensive activity, you know, that we do. And so there's a lot of ways to de-risk and add value to a project that not necessarily, you know, involve drilling. So, you know, uh, again, the, the, the key, the key part is, you know, having, and I, again, I'm sure, you know, each of you have a sort of, you know, when, when you started this deposit, you had a pretty good plan model in mind as to what we're shooting for. And this is, this is what it's going to look like. The, the reality is, you know, once you get, once you get, once you get to that number, you have to ask yourself, you know, if, if I drill another, you know, half a billion tons off, is that going to add any value or is that going to be all you're doing is filling out years 36 through 44 of a mine plan, which on an NPV basis, you know, isn't going to add up, you know, add up to very, add up to very much at all. So, yeah, no, I, I think you need to be very conscious that you're doing resource drilling to add value, not just to make the number big for the sake of being big. Right. I mean, I think your project, you, you probably, probably came at it that way, did you? Because you could have kept going. Yeah, look, I think we feel the same way about the scale. I, look, it's always nice to have a much bigger project, but I think the way I look at it is, you know, another red flag for me is looking at these companies that are having these enormous multi-billion dollar projects because the economies of scale are what's required to get the 
the economics to look passable at a, at a you know, reasonable commodity price assumption. Um, what I like to see is, a, you know, I don't mind if it's a huge project, as long as there is, for a junior, a single asset company that has got restricted balance sheet, a manageable financing story, you know, sub a billion dollars um, or in that ballpark. But it really depends on your market capitalization, right? If your market cap is a billion, well, then you can probably raise that money relatively easily. So what I like to see is a project, a starter project that is commensurate with the market capitalization of the developer that I'm investing in. Can they actually finance to build the project they're talking about? Right. Okay. So but, but tell, tell me this then, Hayden. I'm going to stick with you, Hayden, because the, the guys have got you know, different discovery. Are you, Mark, you're very much all up in Timmins, but you've got multiple discoveries up there and, and multiple um, pro- projects up there. Simon, likewise, you've you've got, you know, pro- projects, different jurisdictions and, you know, um, what three, what, yeah, you've got multiple projects. Hayden, you, you've you've kind of got that so almost single risk. I know you've got expiration, etc. But you kind of got that single risk profile. Was there a bit of you when you were you were trying to work out? Well, how do I de-risk this thing? I've got to get the scale up. You've done that. Check. You did that. Got out that really quick. Was there a bit of you that thought because this is about me after all? I want to know what I should be doing. Should I be going out buying another asset? Should I be spreading the risk and opportunity? How did you get comfortable with that single asset approach? So it was slightly different for us because the discovery had already been made. And in my conversations with Sergio, our our geologist, it was pretty clear that the resource was going to grow. We didn't know how big it was going to grow, but we knew it was going to get bigger. And therefore, we would probably get to a scale which was meaningful enough to solve that problem. I think if you've got uh, more early stage exploration, then yes, it's a benefit to have multiple projects. Um, It's a blessing and a curse to have two or three world-class projects um, or, you know, exceptional projects like Simon does because then you have the competition for capital. But equally, it's a benefit because what we know, as Simon mentioned, Peru is, uh, was, you know, let's say two years ago uh, in the headlines, um, although I would always say don't believe the headlines, uh, but the pendulum has swung back meaningfully in the right direction. And in the next 12 to 18 months or two years, who knows where you'll be. So there's the benefit of being able to uh, move with the tides. I think you know, I was less worried about Chile, although Chile was also in the headlines. Um, you know, all the comments that I've made to you have proven to be correct about Chile, which is it's still a T1 jurisdiction. Um, it's still very easy to do business. And so we didn't have any real concerns there. So, yeah, I think if we didn't have the quality of asset we have, it would be lovely to have another one that we could sort of switch our capital allocation to. Uh, but right now we're pretty comfortable with, with the project that we've got in the jurisdiction we've got. Okay, and, and Simon, when you look back over, you know, you, you've got some great assets. I mean, you know, m- meaningful in e- each category um, in terms of the size of the opportunity there. But is there anything that you look back on and go, look, I, I get that we had COVID and I get we've had inflation and I get we've had supply chain issues, you know, which, which, which has driven the printing of money, it seems, around the world. Anything you look back and go, you know, I wish I'd come at it slightly differently. Or I, I know hindsight's twenty twenty, but what, at the time... I, I mean, I think for us, I mean, Hayden's right. You know, you've got three assets, you know, where are you going to allocate capital? And um, you know, capital is finite and you, you know, you have to raise it. And we've all got projects that are going to need a lot of capital, you know, when we build them. So. For us, for us, as you know, we 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 wanted to spin out the uranium earlier this year, and the market really wasn't. It wasn't that it wasn't receptive; it was receptive, but it was just a terrible time to try to raise money for a, a, what effectively was a new IPO. Um, so for me, I wish we'd maybe got to that sooner. Although, again, having having this um, the ability and the balance sheet to be able to bring it back in company and continue to advance it made the decision easy for us. We won and on it. So but I, I think Hayden's right. I think at some point here as we evolve, clearly three advanced development stage assets are, are a lot for a junior to handle. And so, you know, and, I, and uranium doesn't fit long term with lithium. So we will have to do something with that. And I think when you're left with the two lithium projects, they're both extremely large projects and again need a lot of capital. So I, to, to, to this point, we've been very well uh, capable of, um, of, 
of, of handling both, and I think continue to do so as we move through PFS. But you know, you will come a time where you're going to have to have the right partners or the right, uh, you know, right other groups involved to help advance them. So, you know, that's that's probably the the blessing of having having them. You've got the geographic and geological diversity, but then you know you do get to a point as capital becomes tighter and you look for bigger and bigger sums. Where you're going to what, to what are you what are you saying in terms of learning though? Are you saying that it's because you, obviously you, you made a decision and then you looked at the market and went, "No, nah, that doesn't make sense now." That's that makes sense then if the market stayed the same or gone the way we thought, but it doesn't make sense now. So that's a kind of you know um, thinking on your feet and being you know um, n- nimble and agile and all that, all that's good. But was there was there anything anything there that you again? I want to I want to get back to you know. How do management teams make the decisions? How do you work out whether it was a good decision or not? Do you look back and evaluate yourself or you go, that's history, let's look forward? I think it would be easy to look back right now and say, you know, when we bought um, Peru, we should have bought a nice big pegmatite. People see those as a easy, easy, that's what the market loves right now. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, Markets, like we talk at the top, it's all about patience. I, I know that this asset in Peru is a world-class asset. It produces a battery-grade lithium carbonate. Um, the pegmatites don't. So, you know, it, um, you know, right now, everyone sees them as low risk. Um, it's the same with claystones. You know, a year or so ago, claystones were, were all to the fore because, you know, you can produce a high-purity product without needing to ship it to China or or anything else. So there's swings and roundabouts. But I, no, I, I mean, I look at it, we made the right choice at the time. And I think ultimately it comes back to Mark's point of comment about quality and scale. And these are projects that are definitely going to have their day. So you have to be patient with the market swings and you have to be patient with jurisdictional issues from time to time. But as long as you can keep, keep making progress, I think it's key. Right. And Mark, what about you? Key, key learning. So we, we speak every week. We talk about nickel price, what the market's doing, what it's traditionally done. And you think you can sort of navigate it because you kind of follow the historical patterns. But it's been a funny couple of, you know, three, well, funny three years or so. Gold, gold normal rules don't apply. You know, c- copper price has been up. It's you know come off and coming back again. Nickel, the same. We've been on, on a quite, quite the ride. How do you make decisions during a period like that? You, you need to really focus on what the, um, again, if you try and based on what the market's doing six months from now, you know, if I should be, become a just a straightforward commodity trader, if that's my view of the market, you know, you, you do have to look, you know, out over a longer horizon, but you do need to believe in the commodity over the longer horizon to be able to, you know, in, in terms of where it's going, in, in terms of the assets, you know, that you acquire and the pace at which you develop them at. You know, I, I think for us, you know, talking about in terms of asset acquisitions, you always have to evaluate whether, you, you know, that made sense or not. But for us, you know, with Crawford, we were basically unlocking, you know, one deposit. But, there were, you know, we realized because, again, these things have a very distinct geophysical footprint that there was 20 of these lying around in Timmins. And so, you know, for less than 10 percent of our capital, we were able to lock up, you know, 20 of these properties at a very early stage, taking advantage of the fact that, you know, during some of this market turbulence time where people weren't really sure, is nickel going to turn out to, you know, is Indonesia going to flood the market and we really don't need any other projects with that kind of uncertainty hanging over, it's easy to negotiate with someone to say, look at, well, you know, you, you can take your chance, you know, but, you know, this is, here's some cash and shares now, uh, you know, to, to give us, to give us your property. So again, if you're able to take advantage of, you know, your long-term view of where things are headed to be able to do, you know, uh, good acquisitions in, in a way that makes sense, then, then, then I, I think that's helpful because as we unlock Crawford, you know, the value of each one of these other things is ultimately going to be unlocked. And the other key thing is we're not blowing our brains out. You know, we're doing very, very, very white space drilling just to confirm that the nickel is there in the event that we get a hostile takeover. It's easier for the big companies to say, okay, you know, this deposit could have this much nickel and that deposit could have, that much nickel and and again we sort of i think a theme in terms of you know people who actually develop stuff you get very good about in terms of managing your spend and managing your your share structure um you know to be able to position yourself to maximize the value on it on, on a takeout 
uh, in, in the future. And, and so, you know, that's something that you're always evaluating is do I spend that, you know, do I spend that additional money now or do I just sit tight, you know, for a little while? Again, the, this sort of theme of patience, uh, you know, running through everybody's comments here. Right. So, hey, now I'm going to look at you because what Mark said there was you got to be sure about the thematic, the, the commodity that you're, you're, you're um, involved with. And you were previously at Emerson as Potash Company. I was pretty sure two years ago, and I was telling everyone I think Potash is, is the next big bet. But you switch companies. Um, I'm not sure how Emerson is, is doing. Um, you're, you're, I think you're still a director there, right? Is that right? Right. Okay. But you obviously the bulk of your time is, is, is Maramaka. Do you, in terms of the picking of the commodity, how, how do you, cause as an investor, I've got to think like that. Mark, Mark has said I should, and I, I think he should. Um, you've got to pick the right kind of commodities, not a case of let's just jump on any old ship. It'll pay my salary for a while until I find something more interesting, which I see a lot of out there. So how, how do you, how did you go about sort of thinking, well, actually copper, Copper is going to work. I do believe this EV thematic, this infrastructure thematic, it is going to work this, you know, for, for me. I mean, you must have thought about it in those terms, right? At some point, at some point. And again, going, yeah, going back to the long term view that we require, <clears throat> you know, I was bullish on uranium for a long time before, before I was finally right. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, I think copper is, it's pretty well documented that it's quite a mature industry. It's a very large market. It's been around for years. And with the exception of aluminium, there's no substitute for it as an electrical conductor, uh, no viable, economically viable substitute as an electrical conductor. So, you know, as the electrical infrastructure expands, we're going to need more of it. Recycling will take up some of that, but it's just not going to be enough. And so there has to be more copper brought into production. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that there has to be something that occurs, most likely an increase in price, uh, which won't last forever, but it will almost certainly be a relatively strong increase in price for a relatively sustained period while new production catches up to, to ease some of those um, demand. Now, that's not even including this electrification and decarbonisation, which I think many people in the mining industry would say is unachievable considering how much raw material is required to do that. So if you then overlay that on the top, I think all of these commodities that we're talking about are just going to be uh, required in such astronomical amounts that it's hard not to be bullish about them um, at, at this point in time. So that's that's really the thesis. And I agree with Mark, you know, you've got to, the, the reason I went to Maramaka was because I believed, uh, well, first of all, it was the time I thought that Emerson was going to shift into construction and uh, we brought in an expert potash CEO but also I had a strong belief that copper was a commodity that I wanted to be exposed to. I would have loved to get into nickel, but it's even harder to find a good nickel project. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think that that's how I made the decision to move over into, into copper. Right. Okay. And I mean, Mike, well, the Hayden brought it up that, you know, fi finding big nickel projects is hard. You, you, you've, you've told me that, I'm hearing it from others. We need all of the above, right? That, that's that's the line we we say quite a bit. Um, but again, just just for the kind of maybe the uninitiated and perhaps people new, new to this, the, the nickel market is sustainable. The well, demand story for nickel is sustainable. Why? Why? Because you've got basically its its main use historically has been stainless steel, and it'll continue to be that way. And stainless steel is a great product as a sort of high high strength weight high strength to weight ratio material, um, which is highly recyclable, which is the kind of thing people want to use. And oh, by the way, you know, uh, LFP batteries are great for electric cars with, with smaller range. If you need a big, big SUV or pickup truck, it's got to be a high nickel battery. And so you've got this major new use uh, going forward. So, you know, we need millions of tons of new nickel capacity per year. And we've had very little greenfield exploration success over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and so, you know, any new nickel discoveries are, you know, you know, uh, particularly outside of Indonesia, um, as the, as the world supply chain basically separates, uh, deglobalizes, uh, you know, those, those, those assets, you know, I think are going to be, you know, increasingly valuable going forward, which is why I sort of came back into nickel again. Right. And Simon, just again, for the, for the uninitiated, 
um, lithium to balance. Are you at all nervous about talk about designing lithium or any of these commodities out of batteries or new technologies come along coming along? Is the demand there for lithium going forward? We've seen a, off the back of a very erratic pricing year. Yeah, it's been it's been all over the map, and again, it comes back to, to patience. Now, I mean, I as you know, I I was in cobalt before, and you know, there are moves to cut down the amount of cobalt and batteries and and things like that. But but what, what attracted me to lithium is it's 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 the lightest metal. It's very energy dense. Um, I don't see that any of these other technologies that are, are put out there really make any sense for what lithium is used for. And if you think about transportation and, and uh, cell phones and other devices, it's perfect because of its lightweight nature. Even solid state will still be very lithium dependent when that comes along. Uh, and, you know, you don't need to ask me, just look at all the big, you know, end users, car companies, OEMs, you know, they're all um, getting their, their supply chains in place for, for a long, long time to come. So I, you know, there's a myriad of research out there. So you may get these short term bumps around as people worry about China's economy and the, the world economy and, you know, flows and apps. But I think I haven't seen any research um, that doesn't suggest that we're going to need a lot more uh, lithium for a lot more EVs, um, you know, by the end of this decade, and it's just going to snowball from there. So I think all three of these commodities, nickel for what Mark said, I think, I think, I think copper is probably even more structurally uh, going to be a deficit going forward than the lithium, which has huge problems. I mean, I mean, lithium is abundant in the world, but the problem is getting it out. It's very tricky. And can you get it out at a decent price? And that's that's the problem. It's a, it's a chemical process. It's a very challenging uh, mineral to, to 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 mine in that process, and uh, it's uh, it's challenging. But it's definitely going to be uh, around in my view for a long, long time to come. Music to my ears. Music to my ears. Right, gentlemen, you, you've you've given up your time, given us lots of good advice, thoughtful. Um, so a lot for me to think about um, there. So I appreciate that, and for people listening and, and reading about this. And um, I'll let you sign off, Hayden. Why don't you give us a kind of um, reasons to buy Maramaka copper? Well, we're we're developing a, uh, a really unique copper development. Uh, copper oxide project in northern Chile, a tier one mining jurisdiction, as Simon said, into uh, one of the clearest structural deficits you're likely to see in, ter in terms of s supply and demand in a commodity. Uh, it's the reason that I'm as bullish as I've ever been on any commodity as I am on copper. And uh, we're really pushing forward to come into the market at exactly the right time to take advantage of that uh, structural deficit, which we see on the, on the horizon. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, looking at the commodity, I think you can see some short-term fluctuations, but I think medium to long-term, there's only one way that this is going. You know, we're going to need more and more lithium. We need more and more domestic lithium. And I think having diversity with, uh, with a hard rock, a, a, a wonderful hard rock project and a very large-scale claystone project right in the middle of the U.S., I think we're really well positioned as we develop both into the PFS and beyond. And, you know, and I mentioned uranium, I, you know, we came upon that asset by accident. It came with the Falchani asset when we acquired Plateau. But I think uranium is really about to have its day. And it's one of the biggest undeveloped uh, projects with, with, with some of the best economics out there. And at the right time in the market, we will find the time to, uh, to, to, to spin that out to the benefit, for the benefit of our shareholders. So I think when you consider all those pieces going, I mean, with a with a recent pullback in in lithium stocks, you know, I'd say that this is a really good opportunity to get into the story. And I think with with our diversification and focus, we would be top of the list in my mind. With uh, Canada Nickel, uh, we will have a feasibility study on our Crawford project, which is the largest sulfide discovery since the early 1970s. We're already one third of the way through the permitting process, and so we're one of the only new large sources of nickel uh, outside Indonesia coming to the, mar coming to the market uh, this decade. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, we have consolidated 20 properties uh, around uh, Timmins, which is a very established mining camp, uh, which we think each have the potential to host another Crawford 
uh, type deposit. And, and we think this area, this Timmins Nickel District, has the potential to be the world's largest sulfide district globally. Well, gentlemen, I um, like, appreciate time. So, um, Mr. Mark Selby, uh, Chairman CEO of Canada Nickel, thank you. Hayden Locke, President and CEO of Maramaca Copper, thank you. Simon Clark, CEO of American Lithium Corp, I thank you as well. Appreciate your time today. Thank you, gentlemen.